Grazie Gigi. Hello. Can somebody tell me that they can hear and see, see and listen to me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Okay, one minute. I think uh, I still can't hear you. Uh, okay, so I sure. must do something from my end. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Just give a minute, okay? <laughs> Sorry, sir. Right, I'll tell you. Um, just give me a minute, okay? Microphone, are we open? Test mic. Hello. Hello. We can hear you, sir. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Can you hear us, sir? Uh, good enough, I can see you, but I can't yes, still hear you. Take, take your time, sir. Um, where is the problem? Um, let's see. Restriction chats, participants. There are 53 participants. Okay. It's not muted. Um, could you hear me? Yes, sir. Three twenty. I am ready. So uh, there had been a small delay, but I think that is uh, understood uh, when you work with these electronics. Yes, no worries at all, sir. Uh, is it all right if we start, sir? Yes, I am ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I cordially welcome you all to the 12th lecture of the short course on cultural linkages to Asian ideology. Today, they're focusing on the Asian political landscape, the role of religions in post-independent India and Sri Lanka. The program for today is such that the lecture is scheduled to be for 45 minutes with a short break of five minutes 
followed by another 30 minutes of a lecture and a question and answer session. And I now have the honor of introducing our guest lecturer, Honorable Dr. Suren Raghavan. Dr. Suren Raghavan is a Sri Lankan academic and a former governor of the Northern Province. He is an analytical researcher with a passion to empower student teaching. His PhD and master's studies were in comparative politics and the role of religion in peace building with multicultural societies. Our esteemed guest is a research fellow at Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Oxford. He has also rendered his services as a visiting professor at St. Paul University and a visiting research scholar at the Department of History, University of Colombo. Dr. Raghavan is also the chairperson and national director of Colombo School for Critical Studies. His fourth book, Nations and Nationalisms in Sri Lanka, is scheduled to be published in February of 2022. Following the 2020 parliamentary elections, Dr. Raghavan was invited to the Parliament of Sri Lanka as a nationalist MP representing the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Sir, we're profoundly honored to have you here with us today and we warmly welcome you to deliver the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been my honor again to be associated with uh, what I assume as one of the most uh, promising intellectual and practical uh, advanced studies, academic studies institutions in this country. Others have different schools of thoughts, but uh, Kotlavala Defense University uh, is a promising independent university as I see that. And I wish them that they will stand out from all the other universities in Sri Lanka to produce what we call primarily the intellectual integrity and the cutting edge critical thinking of this country. Some are disassociating, uh, some are even critical of me, my association with uh, this university, particularly because it has this word called military university. And as a political scientist, I believe uh, military, security, reasons of security are part of politics and one cannot uh, disintegrate or disassociate, uh, particularly in a country like Sri Lanka. So I have uh, mentioned this to very clearly to His Excellency the President as the commander of the all forces in Sri Lanka and to uh, General Kamal Gunratna as uh, Secretary of Defense and to uh, General Shavindra, uh, all three of them, that uh, Kotlavla Defense University needs to get more intellectual input and to vigor and with absolute honesty for intellectual commitment, we should promote this university and I stand by for that vision. So therefore, it is my uh, privilege today to be invited by you, uh, though it's an undergrad uh, lecture, uh, but I think that is where the new thinking is coming. Uh, therefore, we need to be uh, able to listen to them. And I hope in the question and answer session, I will be able to uh, hear some of the actual questions that uh, young thinkers in your university uh, maybe uh, grappling with and are interested in uh, finding answers to. So, to keep it um, uh, precise, uh, I'm going to be a little deviating from my average style. My average style is to be do lectures in normal, uh, dialogical uh, manner. But since this topic is such uh, vast complexities, uh, because we are talking about uh, your wider topic was to talk about the South Asian geopolitical landscape. I mean, that would be like uh, one end of the sky to the other because South Asia uh, today is home for uh, what we would think, what I would think is 21st century's future. South Asia is the home for all four religions, largest population, and uh, fast growing economy and where uh, more than at least 50 languages spoken 
uh, and with two nuclear neighbors and uh, so with the diversity of south asia the south countries uh, one to talk about the political geopolitical landscape will be a very wide maybe it's a one week conference topic so therefore with your permission uh, with your coordinator's permission i have uh, kind of reduced the topic to talk about uh, in ideologies particularly what is what i call it the subterranean ideology of south asia which is the relationship between politics and institutionalized religions now i must at the outset must confess i am not going to during my lecture or never in my life i have tried to define what is religion or defend any particular faith this lecture is not about that one can say religions are different to spirituality and religions and spirituality must be talked differently i partially agree with that argument but today's topic as a political scientist my aim is to construct and make some observations the relationship between state making politics and institutionalized phenomenon called religion in particularly focusing on the last decades or two decades in what's happening in india and in our motherland sri lanka in this so you said uh, the first half an hour and then break then question and answer then conclusion is that right yes sir yeah. okay fine i i agree with that uh, but uh, since i am a more uh, uh, more custom to uh, do university lectures in the western world uh, anybody can call me by my first name there's no harm I and mean, if anybody has a serious issue to continue the lecture without asking a question he or her can uh, he or she can raise the hand and then i would like to pause and listen to the question and then continue that academic freedom must be given okay so there are two possible approaches to the comparative study of religion and politics in the modern world the first is to focus on theories and trends theories of uh, religions that is the general way in which religions can influence politics this approach is indeed to provide a theoretical toolbox that will give a student or research of religion and politics the means of to analyze religions intersection or religions reactions with politics in any country any situation the second is to examine the fact on the ground what's happening actually the first one is the theoretical and the second one is a more practical observation ethnographical observations what's happening to uh, religion and uh, politics in day to day life particularly in country sri lanka and india even particularly during times of election is that we say there are so many possible perspectives that can be applied to academic study of religion and politics it is a topic studied by political scientists sociologists anthropologists historians psychologists philosophers theologians and increasingly power seeking politicians are studying of course how to use religion for their political victories many of these approaches are not compatible or reconcilable with each other study of religion one must reflect for them i am a trained to be a political scientist i am trained as in the area of comparative politics so i name myself as a political scientist with a phd so phd there is another acronym for phd that is permanently head damage so all what i'm going to say and think are going to be political science perspective that's what i know that's what i'm trained to think like there may be other 
perspective and i know there are other perspectives but today's lecture is my lecture so i would try to construct out of my thinking what i think as the relationship between politics and religion in sri lanka and india throughout history especially from the 19th century a long list of thinkers from a wide range of disciplines have contributed to this topic of religion and society or religion and politics in the uh, narrow sense there is a huge body of literature if you as uh, first degree uh, scholars first degree researchers if you go to google scholar which is a very good tool um, if you search the relationship between religion and society religion and politics you would see a large body huge body of literature be produced by uh, asian african european scholars researchers so this the interest on this topic had never died in fact i must my own personal observation is that Uh, against the predictions of the 19th century that religion will be a non entity religion will be taken away from society there will not be any relationship between religion and society and politics <coughs> excuse me against those pundits and their predictions religion has come back to politics as undeniable and one of the most i would say even the most powerful uh, factor to consider in the modern world this is true when you hear about our local news how our own uh, mahasangha and the members of the sasana are involved in day to day politics in strikes negotiations demands this is true about india how sadhus and shiv sena is on the street almost every day and then when we look about little further the idea are about uh, isis al qaeda and other islamic fundamentalist groups and the recent taliban take over of a strategic landmass called afghanistan now all these are symbols and signs and indications that religion has come back or religion is very much active as against those who thought religion will be a forgotten factor so this uh, debate on the secularization and desecularization took somewhere around the 19th century key thinkers of the 19th century and early 20th century contributed to this factor while secularization theory was never a monolithic and different components but simply secularization theory predicted a decline of religion perhaps the disappearance of religion and in the famous quotes by thinkers like karl marx to say religion is the opium of the masses which means that people took religion as a pain killer uh, as a forgetting factor without addressing their actual structural social issues uh, that was marx's uh, basic idea then of course we have famous uh, quotation by uh, nietzsche uh, again a german thinker who said god is dead the idea about god is dead because god himself or herself cannot answer the human questions anymore therefore the masses are going to retaliate and say god is a dead wood and this list is not uh, limited to karl marx and uh, nietzsche uh, frederick nietzsche's uh, pronunciation was particularly echoed by durkheim sigmund freud marx weber and those who are those those of you who are reading for social science will know these are big names and we have theories com uh, comprised by them and we have paradigms and theoretical frameworks i mean if you are going to do basic sociology these are names that you can't bypass because they have established such strong 
opinions and thought processes in the late 19th, mid 19th, late 19th, early 20th. Key figures in this secularization were Karl Marx, Emil Durkheim, Sigmund Freud, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, um, Valery, and Max Weber. While most would not be predicted the utter disappearance of religion, some made exactly this prediction. For example, in 1966, Anthony F. Wallace confidently predicted that the, I quote, evolutionary figures of religion is extinct. Belief in supernatural power is doomed and soon will die out all over the world, not just in Europe. This was Wallace in 1966. His book, page 20, uh, 266 to 67, he's explained. Why did they say that religion will die or disappear? They gave the reasons, following reasons. The, each of these reasons have a different talk, uh, long enough to make another lecture, but I will just mention so that you could do your own research. They said urbanization, that is people moving from villages to urban cities will be the phenomena of the 20th century. Therefore, when they leave their villages, they will leave their religious beliefs also and become citizens of urban cities, which religion has nothing to do. So urbanization. Literature and education. So when people move on, they will have more literature to read, alternative literature. Because if you take like 50 years ago, an average uh, grandmother, now my own grandmother from Kalutar, she only read the newspaper in the morning and in the evening she read the Jataka. That's true. She was given the Jataka Katha story from the temple, Kalutar Mahavihara. And she was very that. That is true. So we village people have little, little limited access to alternative literature, modernism, postmodernism, structuralism, post-structuralism, positivism, post-positivism. Those were not available. So this second argument was that literature and education will take educate people, so they will leave. Thirdly, science and technology. Science will tell that uh, diseases are by bacteria or virus like COVID, it nothing to do with the Deyyangye leader. There is nothing called the Deyyangye leader, Amma Orungye leader. These are all sciences and technology, medicine can cure them. Therefore, religious beliefs will be Kali Amma Gaut, Yandu, and Neha. You don't have to go to Kali Amma to cure uh, uh, disease. Third argument. As a result of this, there will be enlightenment and rationalism. As a result of all this, people will become more enlightened. They will know the world. They will know the sec um, what the rest of the world is doing. And they will develop a, a sharp, rational mind. Tarkic buddhya. Agama. Samajin. Uh, it's like you uh, will become more rational and therefore they will give up religion. Then they also predicted competing political ideologies will replace religion like Marxism, communism, socialism, capitalism, uh, secularism, environmentalism, feminism, um, you know, minority rights, those ideologies will replace religious beliefs. People will be more interested in and active in these areas than uh, so more women will be in uh, talking about environment and feminist rights than going to church uh, or temple or to COVID. And more young women will be more interested in uh, asking for first wave, second wave, third wave feminist rights than to be in the Dahampas. This was their prediction. Now, any of these predictions, I should say, are not per se, Balu Balmata, Prima Prisya, are not wrong. These are also happening, right? And one other uh, thing they also felt was that development of the modern state. Why? Modern state will answer questions of the people. Poverty, 
employment, uh, infrastructure, modern state will answer these issues. Therefore, people don't have to go to believe, people's belief in religion will be very much reduced. And by result of all these, religion will be entirely a public, uh, rather a personal matter than a public issue. It will be what I believe will be my belief. What, uh, let's say, who is the, let me pick one, uh, W-A-T-L Kumar or Lakmali or Navaratna uh, or even Lienage. What you believe individually will be different to my belief. So therefore, we don't have to clash and we'll keep our religions at home. So these are the reasons, these social thinkers, as mentioned earlier, the reasons that they gave for the disappearance, the possible disappearance and death of religion. But what happened? As social scientists, political scientists, and as researchers, we always must be able to be empirical, be ethnographical. We, we may believe and hear something and read in the text, but when we go home, when we see on the street, when we look at the society, we must be able to read what is happening in the society in comparison to the theoretical text that we read in the universities. As, an of, as, a, as a result of this, social scientist, political scientist, anthropologist, politician, and you, even as young students, would have observed that from early 1990s, there has been an increased discussion, increased involvement of return of the religions, of the resurgence of religion, as we call it. In the academic literature, they call it return of the religion. The biggest contribution to this was made by an American uh, scientist, um, social scientist called, actually he's an economist originally, then he turned his economic theory into this, um, into a political theory. He, Samuel Huntington, Samuel Huntington predicted that there will be a clash of civilization. The world will uh, face a third world war based on our culture and civilizational beliefs and religion will be the epicentric engine of that clash. So this uh, clash of civilization thesis was highly critiqued, accepted, debated. If you just Google, you could see uh, the amount of literature that has produced. So it was kind of a, a bombshell that was dropped in the academic world and it just took off. Um, so 19, uh, 1990s onward, there is the return of the, in the resurgence of religion. So both religion that happened, but our empirical experience as against the 19th century social scientists has been something different. Why I'm saying this? Both world wars happened in the 20th century, where people are supposed to be absolutely scientific, absolutely rational, but we killed nearly 60 million individuals, children, women, unprotected people, innocent people mostly during a war, World War I and II. How did that happen? How are we even justifying 60 million innocent deaths? 60 million largely innocent people, others are armed. The great sense of religious establishment happened in Arab. In the entire Arab world, world was taken over by the Iranian revolution that happened in early uh, and mid 90s. Iran was a kingdom earlier under a king called King Shah, and it was toppled by a religious leader called Ayatollah Khomeini, who established, you know, Iran is uh, Islamic, but it is not Sunni Islam like Saudi Arabia. Iran practices uh, um, Sunni and uh, the other sect of Islam is uh, what's called uh, Sunni. Uh, I, mean, I will say that, okay. Uh, they are a uh, religious uh, minority in the Arab world. And Ayatollah uh, established the religious order in Iran. In fact, world's one of the best postmodern thinkers, uh, that is Michel Foucault, 
was so excited about this revolution that happened. He called the Iranian revolution the order of the new world, though it was had a absolute religious uh, favors. So Iranian revolution took place. More religious fundamentalist groups have become forward in India, Arabia, Africa, European countries. Most liberal states in Europe have not been able to remove their official affiliation to the religious uh, thoughts. Then let's say uh, some of these so-called liberal world, liberal champions of the liberal uh, order countries, Canada. 1867, Canadian constitution was written and ratified again in 1982, as much as close as 82. But in the Canadian constitution, part one refers to God. Germany rewrote a new constitution in 1949, having in their preamble a reference to God. Norway, 1814, the first draft, 19, 2019, they rewrote and made some adjustments to their constitution, but Article 2 talks about God. Swiss constitution, 1760, first drafted. Now, 1999, in their preamble, they say they believe in Supreme Court. So, while all these social scientists have predicted, even those countries which are called liberal and modern and democratic have not been able to deviate or dismiss the idea about God in their official document called their constitution. So this is a serious issue. I would say, therefore, the resurgence or return of the religion is actually not a return of religion. Religion to return, religion went nowhere. It didn't go. It stayed where it was. Maybe its voice was unheard. Maybe the secular modern thinkers put their, their religious voice down, but it has resurfaced very strongly. Secondly, secular modernity failed. Why I'm saying religions have come back? Modernity, modern, Nutanavadeya Kelapata Hadunwadunu, Nutanavadeya Tulin Ativiaki, Yahapat Samaja, Kilimadavu, Balapurutun, Bohuratavalvula Katigrati. The hope that rational man and woman will build a better society has been diminished. So the reason for this is that more modern societies are still finding deep challenges to deliver justice to their women, justice to their unemployed youth, justice to their poor people who are in the poverty. So these things have failed. The modern state had come to uh, serious issues. Therefore, people are really thinking modern state versus religion. Thirdly, I would say, Secularization has also been an elite-based debate. Now, my grandmother is no more living, but when I were, when she was living, I used to talk to her about this secular state and all. But she used to tell me, Puta, you have gone to university and you know all these things. We are from the village, and all what we know is Therefore, let us live the way we are living, because we haven't done any harm to anybody and we believe no harm will come to dhammo bahu charti dhammaraki dharme pi hasirenna dharme visin raki so i couldn't convince my grandmother or her generation or her previous generation because this entire idea about secular niragamika samaja pili bandhava katikava hudek prabuddha Nagarika Katikawa Pamanak Bhava Pradhanu Kata Pada Patra. Make a European Sabah. Vishwidyalavana Tunna Pamanak Kata Vin Kata. Pali Bahuni Nah. Pali Bhutiana Senaga Ehim Bya Vishan Balana. If you really look at, I will touch upon this later if you have time. The resurgence of the Catholic Church. It is believed that at least 50 million people have come back to Catholic Church after John Paul II and what he did.
another reason my own observation is that why religious religion did not go away from particularly asia and african and even european country like america is the contribution made by the religious leaders against the injustice of the secular state that was believed for instance colonial masters english colonial masters brought lot of things to india and sri lanka they brought education railway parliament election system uh, in india they stopped uh, sati puja where the you know the widow had to jump into the uh, fire of the husband and kill herself and they also tried to reduce the caste system they stopped um, something called devadasi where the low caste beautiful girls were taken to temples and kept them as prostitutes and in sri lanka they brought lot of reforms education railway uh, theater elphinstone theater was built by them uh, then uh, secular schools were started by them namut me hame de kala sec colonial masters failed to give what the fundamental justice as to look after our affairs they were colonial masters so therefore against that injustice colonial occupation great movement was started by mahatma gandhi mahatma gandhi goes down in the history as one single individual who challenged the unchallengeable english british colonial world even before world war 2 ended he started that absolute fight that Uh, went through uh, uh, entire India and which gave uh, vibration to uh, which gave vibration to the European world also. Mahatma Gandhi based his uh, struggle called Ahimsa Satyagraha based on Buddhist, Hindu, and Christian non-violent uh, non-violent uh, engagement. Uh, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talks about forgiving the enemy and cheeking, uh, uh, turning the uh, cheek when they slap one cheek, turn the other sleeve. And then Buddha said, "Forgiveness is the best way because if you are angry, you are holding you are holding uh, a co uh, burning coal in your hand. Give up, then you will be healed." Um, Hinduism talked about that. So Gandhi used this religious. basic religious belief as his fundamental ideology to mobilize millions of indians against colonial masters it's not only gandhi in america martin luther king junior the black leader spoke against slavery and he was absolutely marching the black people against white colonials of in america so as dalai lama Dalai Lama is still speaking for the rights of the Buddhist in Tibet. Ayatollah Khomeini spoke for the uh, Shia Muslims. Okay, now I got the word. <laughs> uh, Sunni against the Sunni regime, the Shia Muslims of uh, Iran, and he established it. Desmond Tutu, the Anglican bishop, took up and supported uh, the great apartheid struggle. of uh, uh, in, in south africa pope john paul ii spoke about poverty and naturally so religious leaders last 40 years 50 years have taken key role in correcting their state and therefore they have brought new validity to religious uh, influence in into politics south african struggle indian struggle um american black pride struggle could not have been won if not for these religious leaders everybody accepts that across the board therefore religion as an identity my third point was religion as an identity brought up a new force the next extremely new force was brought in so much of the 20th century when political scientists address religious identity at all was an element of ethnic or national identity people like uh, ted gur um, anthony horowitz they talked very much they wrote books after books on this 
It was treated little differently from other bases of identity, such as shared language, culture, history, and place of residence, and among others. For much of the 20th century, when political scientists addressed religious identity at all, it was an element of ethnic or national identity. So this reason, I'm not going to tell you because I think the time is running. There are theories of religion and practical, political relevant identity groups how these two became uh, interwoven, inseparably interwoven as a fabric of social formation in the late century. If you read um, people of uh, people like Apple Pie, who had written so much extremely, and Jonathan Fox, who had written extremely, and in India, it's uh, Arjuna Padurai who has written. Uh, in Sri Lanka, I cannot uh, claim in politics and religion, except for my contribution. Uh, in Buddhism, Asan Katilakratna had written, and politics, uh, Nirmal Ranjit has written. Uh, there are a few others also who had written extensively on this. Uh, the argument that religion is increasingly being deprivatized and world becoming furiously religious advanced by several authors, as I mentioned. So, okay, let's now move to uh, who is our coordinator now? Uh, where is she? Hello. Are you there? Sir? Okay, all right. Uh, uh, do you want to take a break now? Because I'm going to talk about uh, South Asian politics, Indian politics, Sri Lanka, and then conclusion. What is your view? No, sir. We can, we can take a five-minute break, sir, and then uh, we can continue with this. Okay, would you take a five-minute break now? Yes, sure. Okay, sir. fine. So it's uh, five o'clock, uh, four minutes to five o'clock, my clock is, okay? So we come yes. back at four? Okay, sir. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
एक ही दिन में में वन ईरमो सुमाल नरम है मंग खटांग करने को आरोप मिला दे तो माय तब तक मैं इसको Okay. Uh, I hope uh, you all can hear me. Yes, sir. Okay, fantastic. Okay, let's start. Uh, thank you for so far staying. I uh, I see sixty-seven uh, participants logged in. Uh, at least they are logged in. I don't know whether they are keeping their pet dog in front of the computer and walk taking a walk. <laughs> that can happen that's all right uh, right uh, we are living in a modern world uh, so, so I, I i think i i i i mean this lecture this is a topic that really demands a long time but i think as academics we must reduce our knowledge focus to capsules where people can take it so i laid the first half of my lecture i laid the foundation for the topic 
and its background and last two centuries, what exactly uh, the major thinkers and uh, the clash between uh, religious, religious uh, secularism camp and practically empirically how religion had come back and the reason for such uh, development in the uh, modern world. So let's refocus our attempt now uh, is to the topic, uh, even subtopic, uh, which is called South Asian religion and politics in South Asia. Now, South is known as South Asia today, the seven South countries and their territory and people and all that, uh, you know the background of it. Uh, so uh, we are part of uh, that uh, re region and regime, region and uh, territory. Uh, so we share some common community with South Asian uh, source society, uh, as well as uh, we differ from the rest of the South Asian society because we are an island nation which has its own cultural, religious, and uh, anthropological developments. The interplay of religion and politics in South Asia has been seen as never any other areas in the modern world. While the modern world uh, talked about a separation of state and religion, South Asia has never promoted that. In fact, every new thinking in South Asia was somehow related to one religious thoughts. The last South Asian phenomenal uh, marching of the society, mobilizing of the society was to mobilize the people against colonial, British colonial masters, and that happened under religious, much of religious influence. Uh, in modern Pakistan, it was leader Ali Jinnah, and modern India, it was the leader Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, modern Sri Lanka, the religious uh, struggle, the freedom struggle was also influenced heavily by people like uh, Anagarika Dharmapala. Uh, and many other uh, bhikkhus who, who were uh, named in the list in our national independence struggle. Uh, I can think of uh, even foreigners who were living in Sri Lanka, uh, Tibet Anandahim, uh, and Kalmadulle uh, Imaladak Hamru, then Ekadwe Sri Subangalahim. These are leaders who took up uh, very strong. Uh, opinion and able to march, uh, mobilize the people's mind and activity against the colonial masters. So therefore, uh, our last collective uh, structural change happened also under religion. So which means I'm trying to establish that the South Asian society was never been able to deviate itself totally from the religious influence. Uh, time to time, it has uh, distanced itself but it has always been a thick, a parallel uh, thought process in our society. And therefore, uh, nowhere else in the world uh, could be studied the relationship between religion and politics like in South Asia. Uh, India's birth, modern India's birth happened on the division of Pakistan and India in 1947. And uh, both were on religious basis. The Islamic people wanted a separate country. Ali Jinnah led that. And then it divided as India and Pakistan. Uh, those of you who are very young uh, should remember that when it was divided, Pakistan was situated in two different places. The people who lived in the Bengal area, Muslims went to what we call East Pakistan, and those who lived in the area of Lahore, Punjab, and Kashmir went to what we call West Pakistan. So uh, Pakistan was a country which had uh, two in two locations, East and West. But later in, in a war, in 1974-35, East Pakistan uh, separated from itself on the basis of Urdu-speaking people, Bengali-speaking people, and which became the modern Bangladesh. Um, India's uh, uh, religious involvement had gone through a number of stages and um, uh, stages and uh, various 
um, changes and cyclical changes, as I would say. Uh, it's separated on religious basis, but it can, uh, came out with a secular constitution. Indian constitution does not recognize any religion. It says Republic of India is a secular. Niragamika Rajya Katiyatai, India no Janaraj Vivasthava Liyavetta. India no Kisidu Agamaka Taipinati, Namut Apidanwa, Prayogikuva, Ema Agama, Gakma Loke Agam, Viswasakarna Takti Binonai, that should be India. But secularism is what Ambedkar, who wrote the constitution for India, was himself a Buddhist, but therefore he, uh, but otherwise he said, uh, Indian constitution, India, Republic of India will be a secular. So in constitution, they are secular. But Nehru, who was the first prime minister, brought socialism. He wanted, uh, he was influenced by social modern thinking. So he, he was very much of a socialist, wearing a red uh, rose uh, in his jacket always, and talking about poverty alleviation and master plan of uh, India for uh, the 25 years master plan of India. Then came Indira Gandhi's time, Nehru's daughter, who became prime minister after uh, some time. Uh, Indira Gandhi, by faith, she did not have any conscious faith. She was not a Hindu, Muslim, uh, Muslim or a, but later people told that she was a Jaina person. But she pushed so much of uh, secularism. She said uh, this whole idea about religion must go away. And therefore, uh, her modern, her government created some major challenge to India. Uh, Kashmir issue, the independence of Kashmir or the Kashmir land region to which part it belongs to, to India or to Pakistan or is an independent country. This issue it has the longest civil war in the world. It's nearly about 70 years now, Kashmir, and uh, uh, the highest warfare, where the highest place where the soldiers are stationed are in Kashmir Valley and Kashmir Mountains, uh, where India and Pakistani soldiers are uh, pointing guns at each other even now. So Kashmir issue became a major whether it belongs to Hindu India or Islamic uh, Pakistan. That again brought up Indian secularism and religious debate to a very high issue. Then a major issue happened within, uh, major incident happened uh, during Indira Gandhi's uh, regime. The Punjabis who were in India demanded a separate state called Khalistan. And a guy called Bindranwal was their leader. He mounted an armed struggle for a separate Khalistan. And during that time, the edge of the Khalistani war, the main rebels were in, main rebels went and hid in their major holy temple called the Golden Temple in Amritsar. Bindranwale took his troops and went and hid there. But Gandhi gave order to the Indian army to invade the temple and kill all of those rebels, which went as an absolute vibration to the Indian, uh, Hindu, and Sikh uh, religious psychology. They felt that this was a disgrace that ever happened. And those Sikh uh, rebels later planned and killed uh, Prime Minister Mrs. Indira Gandhi while in office in the mid 80s, uh, that she was killed by her own bodyguards who was Sikh religious people, and apparently 62 bullets were found in a dead body or something like that. They completely shot and killed. That was a shocking thing. And then later, another issue, Khalistan Golden Temple, that finished and Indira Gandhi's murder was happening and religious connotations were taking place in political arena. Then another major issue called Babri Mosque. There was a mosque called Babri Mosque in New Delhi. And some Hindu uh, scholars started saying that mosque was built over an ancient Hindu temple called Ram Janabhum, Ram Janabhumi. And therefore, they went and the, the activists went and destroyed Babri Mosque and reclaimed the Ram Janabhumi land. And this gave another vibration. See, India, uh, one 
I must remember India has the second largest Muslim population in the world. The first Muslim population is in Indonesia, 240 million people. And India has 190 million people. So India is the second largest Muslim country in the world. So there, the Indian, if, if it did not deviate as Pakistan, India would have been the home for the largest Muslim population in the entire world today. However, so Indian Muslims are also a strong voice in political making in modern India. So when Ram Jambhum take took place, entire Indian uh, political flavor came across, came immediately back to the political arena. People either opposed or proposed or supported this. And with this, we would find the Ram Bhumi uh, phenomena, the agenda, the agitation was fully backed by uh, Bharati Janata Party uh, under the late leader, Lal Adwani. Lal Adwani was a strong supporter of reclaiming Ram Jambhumi and uh, Atal Bihar Vajpai, uh, Lal Adwani, and their third leader in the rank was modern prime minister second time, uh, Sri um, Modi in power now. So with that, a whole BJP's growth and BJP's parallel group called Shiv Sena, Rashtrapati Shiv Sena, RSS, the more militant group was also growing. And they, then now they are in power, uh, which is Indian scholars call it the return of the Hindutva. That means the, the Hindu ideology as a way of governing. Uh, to govern India under Hindu thinking, Hindu rule, um, uh, that philosophy, that ideology is back in the uh, Indian, very much Indian epicenter of Indian politics. Uh, since independent India has moved, though their constitution talks about a secular state, they are very much moved into more religious uh, connotation, uh, particularly at the uh, Narendra Modi, the present uh, Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, I can go on talking various issues, but I think time is really showing me. Uh, what happened in Sri Lanka? Let's have a small uh, brief, about five minutes more. I'll brief uh, what happened in Sri Lanka, in my understanding. Right? And then we can go for a Q&A if you are still uh, interested in it, right? Uh, I don't know whether it is because of military academy. Uh, still, there are 65 students uh, apparently logged in. I don't know whether they are really logged in. But that's a good sign. What happened in Sri Lanka? Uh, in contemporary Sri Lanka, religion and politics is interwoven. I would say it is not only in contemporary Sri Lanka. If anybody has a written uh, idea about Sri Lankan history, Mahavamsa is our only written uh, interpretational document that the world scholars have agreed upon. Okay, Mahavamsa not only talks about Sri Lankan history, it talks about also Indian history. So according to Mahavamsa, Mahavamsa, all you know, or uh, all of you know, it was authored by Mahavihara Vahasiddhi, Mahanama Mahatir, Mahanayaka Hamdruva, Mahanama Kenam Mahanayaka Hamdruva Thamai, Mahavamsa Pata, Liyanna Patankarte. Unnuhan se, Mahavihara Kena Anuradhapure, Vihara Adipati Hattita Hiti. ලියවුණු Lanka out of good best with that. Me put a pay, Deshapana, Samaja, Sanskrit, Sabiatwe, Buddhime, Sri Lanka. There are no, there are no other literature that is so influential as much as what I call is the Mahavansik literature, Mahavamsik thinking. Now, Vamsa Itihasya Kela, Lanka with Ibino, Vamsa Sahitya Kela, Lanka with Ibino, Vihara Vamsa. Dagab once, Bodhi once, Sasana once, Kila once it has a thin. Eh, once it has a Sahitian, once a Sahitian, Pradhana Kota Salakarti, 
Mahavamsa, Saha e Anubata Yunu, Chulavamsa. According to Mahavamsa, there is no religious difference, there is no separation between Sri Lankan way of governance and religion. It is ever since Mahindu uh, Mahatharatan uh, came to Sri Lanka, preached Buddhism to Devanam Piyatissa, king at that time, Devanam Piyatissa accepted Buddhism and from there onward, a new civilization was born. Palpal Rahul Hamdru, Mepil Bandhava, Sri Lanka, Vithyahas, Tekina, Poteri, Kiya, Venova. Mihidu, after the arrival of Mihidu, and after the acceptance of Buddhism by Devanam Piyatissa, Sri Lankan civilization changed. So modern civilization cannot be separated from the Buddhist thinking Buddhist influence and the influence of the Mahasangha in Sri Lanka. So in Sri Lanka, no, unlike any other country, I would only say it is second to Israel, where Israel has a long book called Torah. And the uh, Torah is talking about how religion and the making of the state of Israel is so important under the promised land. And same way, Sri Lanka is the Janma Bhumi, Dharma Deepa, a promised land, me divayina sattvata va sangika dhani puja karati mil divayina. Ita amatar va budun mahavamse kya ne budun vadiye deshe kya ne Sri Lanka. Kya ne tamarak aluteng apau deshe palna karaniya kya ne budun mehe vadi budun ekya ne. Ita mehe budun ana ng mehe vadi nidya kya ne mahavamse kya ne karna ng apite runga ne budun tunvata va. Ekvata va kya ne tunvata va kya. Three times so three times appearing and uh, adhering to coming to Vadamakiri, Sri Lanka. And by, by that, he blessed Sri Lanka and made it uh, land where dharma will dhamma will be protected. These are our teachings. So there is no uh, country, very rarely a country could be taken uh, as connected with religious ideology as Sri Lanka. Because of this reason, a distinctly interwoven a role was given to the Buddhist Sangha in Sri Lanka. Sangha in Sri Lanka, modern as well as ancient, have an unexpected, unparalleled, uh, cultural and social influence in making uh, politics in Sri Lanka. Uh, I don't have to explain to you that in modern media, if you open every day, there is a Buddhist monk who is making an opinion about something, either something sometimes they are not even knowledgeable. They talk about, uh, they, let's say you, you are at a cave, they talk about even uh, national security, they talk about uh, the military, how the military should behave. Uh, they, they even advise the army commander what he should do or do not. Uh, they talk about uh, economic crisis. They talk about India and Indian politics. They talk about... So hardly any area, a Buddhist form, uh, is not voicing. They talk about education, women, children, uh, even sex education had been a recent topic the Buddhist monks have. So therefore, what I'm trying to establish is that in Sri Lanka, a Sangha has unlimited capacity of influencing our social and political debate. And therefore, from 1948 onward, post-independent first government to the present government, the influence of Mahasangha in state making, in Andhukar, Rajya Karanevi Saha, Palana Balay, Atpakargani, Andhukarnevi, Sangha Vanselage, uh, Abhimatya. Sangya Vahanse Lagi Balapam Tibena Ratak Sri Lanka Vataran Tibena Ratak Swagan at a Baritara. Make a Samahar Deval Matakian at a Vidwa. Make it a highlight to me. The highlights of this issue were um, there was Anagarika Dharmapala's thinking which demanded a special place for Buddhist monks and Buddhism in the politics of Sri Lanka. 
Then that was echoed by great Palpal Ravel, who wrote uh, the Vikshukage uh, Urume, the book he wrote, uh, Heritage of a Buddhist Monk. Bikshun Vahan Silagi Urume Mokat, Ken Kota, Egdasmati Hatalis Hate Liwe Kota. I think there are about uh, 50 or 55 editions of that book now. Modern bhikkhus took that as their blueprint for social involvement. Uh, in so much so that uh, Valpur Rahula, Venerable Valpur Rahula uh, declared in 1946 independent declaration, uh, what is called the Kalaniya Declaration of Independence of Sri Lanka. Then, uh, pr just prior to that, there was a debate called Parnadura debates. There were five debates between the Christian clergy and Buddhist monks. And um, it is said that the Buddhist monk won defeating uh, the Christian clergy. Therefore, re establishing the authority of the Mahasangha uh, back in society and in social affairs. Uh, emergence of uh, modern political uh, idea. In 1958, there was riots. Uh, basically, uh, you all will know, it was considered as the first anti-Tamil riots, but the riots was uh, instigated or riot was originated from an issue whether to use in our car plate numbers a singular letter called Sri. It is this riot called Sri Kolahala. When the government introduced, said, uh, okay, we'll because before that, during the colonial time, all number plates were English. Then government said, now we are independent government, we must have Sri Lankan identity, therefore we will use the letter Sri, like Sri Lanka, on the number plate. So Tamil leaders said, it's all right, we will use Sri, but use that Sri in Tamil letters. Because in Jaffna and other places, what Singhana Sri will not be able to understand, therefore use the Tamil Sri letter. And then, of course, Singhana leaders did not agree to that. They said, no, everywhere it should be Singhana Sri, and then riots broke. There were, again, uh, riots in Jaffna. They were removing the number plate, and they were uh, removing the Sri Singhana Sri letter. As a reaction to that, there were riots in Colombo, attacking the shops, attacking people on the street, which is called the Sin Sri Kola. If you refer to literature, you will know. Then, because based on that language issue, Actually, letter three <clears throat> is more to do with Buddhism than uh, Singhara language. The Sri is a blessed word. Uh, it comes from Sanskrit. It is used in uh, Tamil also. Sri, now when we refer to Narendra Modi, people say Sri Narendra Modi. It's blessed. It's, it's kind of Asirwad. So that is why Sri Lanka, the name was given to Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka Nidahas Paksha, that guy, that person who created that party was called Sri Nishanka. So the letter Sri is always related to it. So the, but it is a religious thing. It is not a language thing. But because the Tamils refused to take it, it became a religious, a, lang a language issue. And the language rights issue, 1958, saw the first organized, premeditated, major political assassination in this country, killing, the elected Prime Minister, SWRD Bandaranaik, uh, by, unfortunately, by a Buddhist monk. Now, some are refusing to accept that, but that's not the truth. This was planned. Uh, literature is enough and well. Uh, this must be studied so that we understand the power of the monks in this country, you know, not to disgrace them, but how they can organize themselves and even go up to the level of doing something Panati, against the Panathipatas. Uh, so it was planned in the temples of Kalaniya. It was given leadership to others. At the end of the day, it was a Buddhist monk who came and shot three times uh, Pandar Naik, the Prime Minister, and two days later he died. That was the first major political assassination in Sri Lanka. Then, with that, the language rights came up and went down a further, and there was uh, other governments which uh, tried to manage this. So this whole idea about what we call, what I call is the Buddhistizing the state. Uh, Sri Lanka Rajya Samajya Bautta Karane Lakvi. A good example is uh, this uh, Sri Pada and Katragama temples. Sri Pada Khanda was earlier worshipped by the Vedas who climbed there. Before anybody went there, they were living 
skin because it is sabara gamo. Sabara means vedda, kale, gamo means kale. So that is where the Vedas lived. Vedas went up there to worship. Later, Mahavamsa says, uh, Gautama Buddha uh, appeared on the mountain. But for a long time, all religious people went there. The Christians went there to think it is the Adam's footprint. And even Muslims went there to Muslims, it meant it's Adam. Uh, in English, it's called Adam's feet. Uh, Muslims went there to say uh, it is the first man, Adam, oh, Adam. That's his, feet, uh, his footprint. And in Hindus called uh, Sivanodi Padam, Shivadevi Angi Patula. Therefore, it became uh, Nallatanya and all the other areas, uh, Tamil names were created in this area. So Hindus went uh, Sivapadam, Sri Sivapadam Te Paka Pokul Romatala, Tamil Le Chola Param. So up until 1950s, now Professor Premakumar Di Silva had done extensive research on that. Up until 1950s, Sri Pad was accepted, worshipped, pilgrim by all religious groups, irrespective of the religion groups. But later in 1950s onward, there was a serious attempt to make this as only Buddhist area. And that's what happened. Now it is predominantly a Buddhist area as we know. And same as Kataragama Deva. It is a Devali, it is not even a, a, a Buddhist temple. And all went there. Even Muslims went there. There is a, Muslim, a small mosque there. And Kadrigama, you know, from Nallur, people came marching via uh, Trinkamali, Batiklu, Ampar, and then came to Kataragama to worship. Uh, the Vedas came, Tamil speaking Vedas came. But after 60, a serious attempt of making Kataragama Devali a Buddhist thing. Today, <coughs> there's more Buddhist are worshipping there and more Buddhist uh, religious affiliations are done there. So the Buddhization of places like Kataragama, Sri Pada, excuse me, I am taking my uh, seat because I think I've spoken one hour now. I will finish to the five minutes, then if you have time, you can ask questions. One of the key developments you must remember is the <coughs> first time in world history and in Sri Lankan history, 19, uh, 2002, all Buddhist monks' political party was created called Jatika Hela Urume. And in, in short time, 2004, nine members of all Buddhist monks entered the parliament. And this is the first time in the history known history of the Buddhist world, Theravada or Mahana, Mahayana Buddhist world, where monks created a political party, contested election, and came to parliament. So between religion and politics, one, is, one must be studied. This must be studied very carefully. Now my PhD is following that area. The key Buddhist monk who uh, propagated and formulated this was the uh, late venerable uh, Gangudabila Soma. Gangudamila Soma really invented a new system of uh, chanting spirit, uh, instructing banner, and engaging with the layman, what I call is the engaged Buddhism, which came from a Japanese Buddhist monks like they were socially involved, socially involved Buddhism. And it had uh, all the charismatic ideas borrowed from where Venerable Gangudamila Soma lived. He lived in Victoria. Uh, of Australia, Victoria Temple. So he saw uh, the other religious organization, how they are organized. He came and practiced here. So he gave this momentum to Jatika Hela Urumea. And unfortunately, he died uh, of a heart attack in, uh, in Soviet Russia, Moscow. Of course, there were a lot of controversies around that death, that some saying that he was planned, assassinated, and he was killed. And it was a coup by the Catholic Church and all that. Somehow it's again religion coming to power. You know, that's what you must understand. Uh, with, the, with his death, JHU came to prominence and they won nine seats. But uh, this is a point that I want you to uh, uh, no, note down, uh, focus on. Jataka Hela Urumea, though it is a Buddhist, uh, all Buddhist monk party, in a Buddhist country where 76% are Buddhists, could not 
survive as a political party and why what happened is something i would say you must take as a research uh, question and study so i'll quickly finish this in sri lanka there is a new in sri lanka in summary religion and politics cannot be separated we have gone through many ups and downs some areas very strongly religious sometimes we have had little less religious uh, but for to uh, the new government led by uh, his excellency the president gotabe rajapaksa maitri uh, mahinda rajapaksa and all his leaders have had a strong buddhist support uh, president up until recent time used to say in his speech that he was won by buddhist votes which is true he he didn't get the tamil votes he didn't get the muslim votes much so therefore he used to tell which i feel that he should not say because he, as a president he may be have voted by buddhist people only but now he is the president for entire sri lanka so he must try to unite that uh, i had requested the president to not to repeat that i think last two speeches he did not which i thank him for so true that he was voted by uh, totally a buddhist rural buddhist and particularly particularly uh, your generation people Now you may not agree with me, and you say you may say no, no, sir. I mean, more clearly, nahi kya kya na? Pura mukhtaran trend ka pura pina sila diye ne. But large number of urban young people, who blue jeans wearing young people, voted for Kohtu because their idea was to recreate a new semi-urban, suburban, semi-intellectual Buddhism. This is my my hypothesis. Huh? Now. There is below thirty first time and second time voters in Sri Lanka are saying, "World has moved moved forward. We have lost as a country. It is because we have not discovered what is our ours. Apne kama gana apita obo de akna hai. Then or me, Johani, me me guy ka wo bolo then or me loko prasiddu ka. Then aage yara me me Sindhu akte no me." Yeah, I mean, local president which song is coming. I hope most of you understand singing. Like there are only, I I see you all singing the name. So, but singing like what they are doing. They are doing. Many people are doing. They 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 are doing. चिंतन යෝහානි සින්දු කියන යෝහානි වුණත් ඒ සින්දුව කියන්නේත් එයා මම හිතන්නේ ළමා සාරිය කැඳගෙන නෙමෙයි ළමා සාරිය අපේ කම නම් සාරිය කැඳගෙන නෙමෙයි එයා කියන්නේ ඔසරිය කැඳගෙන නෙමෙයි එයා කියන්නේ නමුත් එයාටත් අවශ්‍ය කරලා තියෙනවා ඒ අපේ කම ගැන ආපෝ කතා කරන්න දැන් මේක එතර විදිහක අලුත් දෙයක් දැන් මුගාත් මැදව වයසේ ඉන්න තරුණ තරුණියන්ගේ ඒ වුරුත් කියන්නේ අපි කියමු දැන් එයාට මේ මැනේජර්ස් සීනියර් මැනේජර්ස් වගේ ඉන්න අය CIM first degree कर ले योरा है कार का गत्ते आती है बुद्धू पीले में आप तीनों में dashboard है ये गुल्लो कहमते हैं तमंगे पीरित में उल्ल तेल में ये गुल्लो कहमते हैं में में पीरित ते अरे coffee shop पे का मंदन में में बातर मूल्य पे ते coffee shop पे का दिक्कत में पीरित दाग नहीं है ना इलिट के ही लग coffee बोने का आपे culture के का के इतना आलू आलू सुने trend का के मत एक දැන් මම බලන්න සෙලූන් එකකට ගියත් මේ බුදු පිළිමයක් තියෙනවා මේ පහන් පත්තු කරලා තියෙනවා ඒ වගේ දේවල් කරන්න මේ කඩවල් ඉස්සරහා බුදු පිළිම තියෙන රාජ්‍ය ලොට් ඔෆ් ස්ටේට් ඉන්ස්ටිටියුෂන්ස් තරගයකට වගේ රාජ්‍ය ආයතන වල බුදු පිළිම හැදුවා ඉස්සරහින් ලොකු බුදු පිළිමයක් හදනවා සෝ රාජ්‍ය ආයතනයකට බුදු පිළිමයක් හදීම වැරදි කියලා මම කියන්නේ නැහැ නමුත් බෞද්ධකරණය කියන මේ කාර්යවලිය දිගටම සිදු වෙමින් පවතිනවා රාජ්‍ය ආයතන වල පන්සිල් ගන්නවා මම එක වතාවක් I think I'll finish that now මම කියන්නේ දෙකින් මනුව 
මේ වීරහර මේ මගේ ලයිසන් එක මම පිටට ගන්නලා ආට පස්සේ ලයිසන් එක ඉෂු කරගන්න ගියා පිරිත් මේ සිල් අරගෙන ඉවර වෙන තුරු ඉන්න කියලා කිව්වා 8යි 8 මාරින් ඉඳලා 9 වෙනකල් නමේට මම කවුන්ටර් එකට දුන්නම එතන ඉස්සලාම මගෙන් ඇහුවේ සල්ලි ගෙව්වද මේ අර අර හැට සල්ලි ගෙවලා ආවද කියලා බ්‍රයිබ් එක දුන්නොත් සුසමයි ආහ ඉතින් ඒ මම කියන්නේ නෑ ඒක ඒක බුද්ධාගමේ වැඩක් කියලා මම කියන්නේ අපි ජීවන රටාව වෙනස් වුණේ නැහැ අපි තාම පාර නීති කඩනවා හහු වුණාම ලයිසන් එක නැතුව ගියාම රාලහාමිට කල් 500 දීලා මාරු වෙන්න හදනවා නමුත් අපි කා බෝඩ් කා ඩෑෂ් බෝඩ් එකේ බුද්ධ පිළිමේ තියෙනවා so what we are trying what i'm trying to do is you, you must understand that society is trying to embrace religion as a social fashion but not for religious values ensa bauddha karaniya kiyana eka samaje ada disapalanaya thula alut vilasithawak bawata patwin tibenawa do kiyana prashnaya mama oba idriye tabanna kata enisa mata kiyanna tibenne awasana washayen a semi suburban semi i would not call it pseudo it will be controversial a semi intellectual buddhist nationalism is been taking over our politics our uh, social space uh, which is going to influence which has influenced very much our politics and uh, and particularly the singular southern sri lankan politics and uh, this need to be studied and where this will take our society and i wish people uh, like you who are in uh, social sciences uh, will take up such research uh, so that we will know what is uh, store for us in sri lanka so with that my i conclude um, my lecture thank you so much it's almost an hour it has taken place with the break Uh, some of you who would like to uh, see and have my thoughts i will send it as a summary in writing to uh, your director vasuki uh, jasundara jasing she is yes jasundara yes uh, she will excuse me if i mispronounce her surname uh, so uh, thank you so much for remaining so far uh, 59 that's a good number so uh, if you time permits whatever the time permits uh, i can i try to answer some of the question if you have thank you very much i go on thank you very much sir uh, students we can now take this time to ask the any questions that we have so there is a question Uh, that has been sent yeah. in the chat box uh, would you like to read it out for you yes uh, how do i see that uh, chat room maybe right okay one minute aha yes, uh, uh -huh. mata mata then then we menum putnan nan dakla na e mokada question ek kiyanna ko so uh, it says sri lanka has been ruled by a buddhist philosophy based on the dasaraj dharma since ancient times and even today A Buddhist monk advises the rule of Ceylon as well as sometimes they decide the future of Sri Lanka. But we know that there were sixty-one religions in India even in the sixth century BC. Even today, there are many religions in India. But India is an ideal state of secularism with so many religions. What is the main reason why India is an ideal state of secularism and we cannot? And why can't we take secularism to the village level? Well. my dear student i think you are asking uh, a very philosophical question and also very political question uh, india uh, is not a land locked country it is not an island india is called the country mahabharat is the indo civilization one of the greatest civilizations mahajara harappa civilization so therefore new thinking is constantly flowing into india and that is why gandhi said keep india open like a house keep the windows open so fresh air will come but let nobody rob us keep the door closed uh, that was gandhi's uh, 
he said he will firmly stay in the house though the wind comes from different i think uh, there are a number of reasons one is that what i'm saying is india is a ancient trade hub with absolute silk route influence from greek influence from uh, persian influence and even african influence recently it is found uh, it is debated they are finding uh, re- uh, facts to say that the sailboat rural now islam me me hoyagatte egypt wenne me mehe kela man danna eka wenna puluwak poda me mosan sulan tiyenne me nisa mehen thamai nav yanna patang gatte kela so therefore india has always been exposed to uh, various stronger thinking now so to take uh, religious level hinduism animalism and during uh, offshoot of as a hinduism a great thinking like buddhism okay even parallel to buddhism mahavira the great thinker created jainism and then when uh, islam came and met hinduism they created a new religion combining some parts of islam come some parts of hinduism called sikhism so india is able to because it's a large pot india is able to absorb and hold it and make it its own sri lanka is not so we are an island nation uh, and also our um, therefore our thinking have the process of marble society the marble cake society so we have pre buddhist now ap kemo mind the hamdru lanka ta enna kalin tibunu agam pilibandu lankave tiyenne podda ya adhyaneya parnavidana mahatmya karala tiyena adhyaneya podda ak tibena ita kalin api study karanna nahe why is that because we somehow we have been able to think and manage saying that sri lankan actual true history starts from the day uh, venerable mahinda landed here not before we are not bothered about the uh, history before therefore the idea about theravada buddhism being part of religion uh, political establishment is inseparable in sri lanka so if you wish india secularism if you judge india secularism has produced uh, better results and we should embrace secularism which is the modern thinking we must ask the question how shall we do that now i as a scholar wish not to condemn religion and say tomorrow we should uh, take uh, the constitutional rights that is given to buddhism in sri lanka constitution our state religion is theravada buddhism an article very clearly says that theravada buddhism will be given priority and foremost place than all other about other places so that can if you are willing to practice i think true we have to ask what exactly this buddhism means i think in, if you go to pali literature even during buddha's time buddha admitted and accepted other religious practices he didn't condemn them he said i have found a philosophy which i think is the answer to life human life so if you wish you follow me. so it was not a by forcing on anybody and say you must take sil you must wear a piritnul if you must be a buddhist uh, in order to now as a tamil let me tell you this lot of tamil students ask me this question sir why can't a tamil leader become the prime minister of this country this is a fundamental question people ask me the students ask me why can't he become is indirect uh, reason because the constitution says the president or prime minister will uphold and protect and promote theravada buddhism as it is in sri lanka so if a hindu or a christian become prime minister they will can't, they can't promote buddhism because they are different religions they can protect they can safeguard they can give spaces but they can't promote they can't come to a temple and worship and say i am a buddhist uh, now one word uh, some tamil leaders try to do that for instance uh, kadrigama uh, declared himself as a buddhist 
because of because not for, for I don't think it's political reason. His kidney he was a kidney patient. His kidney was donated by a monk, Buddhist monk from Kurunagala. So he said in in relay in reply to that. He want to become a Buddhist and he practiced Buddhism. But others said he is trying to become prime minister, so he is trying to become a Buddhist. Bandar Naik, established Bandar Naik, born as a Christian, baptized as a Christian, named as Solomon West Richway Dias Bandar Naik, and right his uh, memories and all still in uh, high Anglican churches. And he embraced Buddhism in order to become the leader of the country. Right. Uh, so there are some other Christian leaders who had Christian backgrounds, but they were hiding those Christian backgrounds uh, in order to become political leaders in this country. So uh, your question, actually, uh, I have no answer other than to ask yourself, younger people, younger generation people, if you prefer secularism, if you think secularism can answer some of our questions, we must ask why we can't become secular. Why we can't become secular is the historical fact that Buddhism has been given the foremost and number one priority in Sri Lankan social society and politics, and it is embedded in our constitution. That's that's the kind of uh, academic answer I can give you. Thank you, sir. Thank can Sri Lankan politics politicians break free from religion and act independently? They should. But unfortunately, they are not. Most of the key politicians try to sell either ethnicity or religion, whether they are Tamils or Sinhalese. Sinhala leaders are also doing that constantly. Tamil, people, Tamil leaders are also constantly doing that. It is because they think they can't find, uh, if they speak secularism, they can't find uh, votes. That may Langadi Luku Andhura Nekaani, Andhra Kumarachanayaka, may Mari Andhra Kumarachanayaka, Aithi Vedni, Jantavithi Karamunata, Jantavithi Karamunata, Bikshuva Sahabhagi Karagatta, Taipulangi Pakshita, Agama Sahabhagi Karagani Neha Saman. But Ekanisa Andhra Kumarachanayaka, Dalada Maligavagi, Lamanayaka, Hamdru, Hamuvi, Ma, JVP, Nevata, Baudha Karneer, Lakkala, Dekina, Prashne Matta. But Ehema Kalana, Anura King Manga Hapula, Anuru Mataki, Parliament Vedi Mahanaka Vurungi Adaha Sudaha, Anusasane, Upades Ahan in Atu Idriate Yanga Tabaha, Nirate, Samaji Viapar Mukada Samaja, Etheran, Bixua, Yelin Piligan and Isa. See you in Atom Siduino, Bixuagi Adaha Sudas, Musaga, Ekanisa. The correction between religious Buddhist monks. And any social leader, leadership or social movement becomes important. Now, for instance, uh, one Buddhist, one politician who recently condemned Buddhist monks and deviated from was on Mangala Samaravira. And he had ample critics. Then, the parliament is again, Honda Kino, me, at Kalim Manako, at the Spalagin, at any part of the Banna, at the Ainakali, the Marne, the Anuspana Katai, the Honda Minia Karimi Kino, Mama. Parliament to Asani, Sabagna, Katana, Kasani, Mangala Hiti, Matahina, A. Wake in a Minisum, Mangal Summer to Banna Hati Matamata. The Mangala Janapri Uni and Haki in a Katavansa. And Mamitan Mangal Gishapalmi and Navatuni, Ahimuni or Katavansa. Oh, Prasidi Kiva, oh, Mitapasi, Sangavan Senator Namakara, Neh, Peruan Sarane, Neh, Peru, O to the Vinne, Ruan Bekai, Darme, Putta Vitrai, Kimrisa. In Sa, but. Um, apparently, the Samaji in the Ugulu, Palavid Devimata, which and the Danaya, Tirane Karan Noni, Buddhagama, at the Vinagama, Karapinagina, Ekuda, Chande Lina at Chande Dana, the Emnatan, Anagamika, Secular, Sialantum Samana, I did the Samajaks by Lena, Chande Dana, the Kimaker, Ugulangi, Purvas Yutukum. 
uh, 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 Prashna Digata Mahana, as you mentioned, the idea of a secular state is being rejected by a number of religious communities and countries. How do you think this uh, reversal from secularism to religiousness can happen in multi-religious communities without being given way to discrimination? This is a fantastic question um, because I think uh, there is a reason why religion has come back so strongly. Now, for a country like multi-ethnic, multicultural country like Canada, because there is another factor called capitalism and neoliberal market, which is forcing us to become nobody but consumers. There is a human tendency to fight against that neoliberal dehumanizing the societies. Neoliberal market tells use of iPhone, drink Coca-Cola, eat pizza, go to KFC with your girlfriend, wear a blue jeans, use uh, what uh, some laptop created by American market. Now, let me say, ask you this question. If you wear blue jeans, if you wear uh, you know, branded crocodile or Benetton or some gap or something like that, a branded shirt. If you are using iPhone, if you are spending your weekend at uh, your evening friend with KFC, what makes you Sri Lankan? Who are you? Just because you live in this city? No, every society's own identity. That, that identity can, otherwise, I can buy Levi's blue jeans from Amazon and wear it. I can buy a Benetton t shirt and wear it. I can go to KFC and eat. I can drive, uh, let's say, an American vehicle. I can use an iPhone. I can use uh, Microsoft Surface. Actually, I'm using a Surface copy, uh, a laptop now. What makes me a Sri Lankan? What makes me a Sri Lankan is that my identity, that I'm a Tamil born in this country, and I have a distinct cultural identity. And I have born, I am born in multi cultural society. It's, a singly speaking Buddhist. I studied in a Buddhist school. My teachers are Buddhist. My first girlfriend was a Buddhist. <laughs> and, uh, and that makes me a Sri Lankan. And that is why societies, particularly Arabic societies, were against this particularly America-led neoliberalistic market takeover, is afraid that they are losing their social identity and fighting back uh, with violence, with political motivations. So religious return, return of the religion has a reason. It's a counterproduct to the onslaught. Then Ogulan Dhanwa Dhanne, Lanka, Luku me, then there were my travel career, sir, Jack now let I. Amalisa, Lanka, we tea Luku na nae kada valu. Restaurants, cafe, we la tea nae. No, I don't know how. We, Sri Lanka, our fourth income is tea. We are exporting 3 million kilos of teas every year. But I can't drink a cup of tea when I go to a highway. I can't drink a cup of tea when I go to a highway. I can't drink a cup of tea. What's wrong with this society? No shop is selling any more tea Sri Lanka. This I'm telling you. Put it down somewhere. Now, the 15, 20 years time, 
there will be a young people when they are losing jobs when their uh, tea factories are closing down when their mothers and fathers are dying in hunger those boys and girls will revolt against our society what is the fundamental reason why we can't now i'm talking to these consumer authorities and asking the rule if you are a sri lankan cafe if you are a sri lankan cafe selling food sri lankan must have a right to drink a cup of tea that's my argument i'm sorry i deviated from the topic <laughs> yeah so that that will be my my kind of argument plus explanation we are at five o'clock i do have another appointment but anyway uh bigger questions are so this is uh, shenani okay to everyone shenani is asking sir will you be will with all due respect to all the religions and the religious leaders do you think that some politicians or prominent people in power keep silence in order to protect themselves in their seats in some important controversial issues in countries because religious leaders could reveal yes of course that's not a question <laughs> that's an obvious thing people will not because politics is all about uh, shenani Shena. politics is all about what why do people start political parties political parties are created to grab power ruling power मॉडर्न पोलिटीशियन ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड will not do anything harmful to the journey of power grabbing and staying in power making use of religion as a fashion uh, we must permit uh, permit i i can first uh, up the question is okay all right making making use of religion as a fashion we must see the truth as it is uh, <clears throat> this is a huge topic which we should think more and more as youth generation so thank you yes i'm thank that you observe that point so you can have your own debate and ask why we are doing that uh, when one somebody is asking the state to become secular some youth you know recently i'll tell you since you are asking this recently a guy started uh, his tuition classes right some fellow who had studied religion uh, geography in kalambu university he started uh, his tuition classes uh, panti and he advertised saying the classes will start with the uh, madura banadeshana now this guy is going to teach history right and the lecture and end with a sangeetha pradarshan sandarshan this is a tuition class huh? now you remember He is advertising saying, "Madura Bhanadesha na paste de me pantiya pili badu. Avasaane arme gaay kya ke pintu re dara pini. Narthane samag sangi ita sandarsha." So, you must ask where we are landing. If that is what we are soon becoming. Now, I saw this before the advanced level exam started. Most of the tuition masters ended their classes. සමහරක් මට එවලා තිබුණා ඒ ටියුෂන් ක්ලාසස් ඉවර වෙන මේ මේ විදිහ ඇන්සලූට්ලි ඇන්ටි ඉන්ටලෙක්චුවල් මේ නර්තන තිබෙනවා බයිලා කියනවා අර අර දෙරණ ස්ටාස් වගේ සින්දු කියනවා දැන් ඕක නොබෝ දිනකින් විශ්වවිද්‍යාලයට එන්න නියමිතයි මොකද ඔය ළමයි නේ විශ්වවිද්‍යාලයට එන්න වෙන්නේ වෙන කවුරුත් නෙමෙයි නේ එතකොට බලා ගන්න පුළුවන් මම ඒකයි මම නම් කියන්නේ මේ මේ රටේ තිබෙන ප්‍රධාන ප්‍රශ්නය in english i used to tell this i say this and stop in sri lanka's fundamental issue is intellectual dishonesty and spiritual bankruptcy buddhimaya vanka bhavayat adhyatmika bankulod bhavayat thamai sri lanka we pradhana prashna deka e matin 
කරනගෙන ප්‍රජාතන්ත්‍රවාදී ආර්ථික සමාජ ප්‍රශ්න තමයි අපි අද මොකද සෝ sir may i make a small request on yes please students uh, so is there a possibility for us to email uh, the rest of the questions that uh, the audience has to you if only you have time i could ema karanna ogulange questions tika i am i am do i have a phone and it has whatsapp and all that i am more on email so i get about 100 emails or even more a day so if all the 56 students start writing two questions it will be 100 no so send it to either to you or to vasuki and you all send it as one email just copy those questions and send it as one document so that i can sure, and sir. those those uh, students email direct yeah, if necessary i can send them an answer in the email i'll do that thank you very much sir and uh, we have a lot of thanks to that so you can stay on the call for a few more minutes yes जस्टिंग <laughs> It's my pleasure to deliver the word of thanks on behalf of the students of the short course on cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology. First, I would like to thank our lecturer, Honorable Dr. Suren Raghavan, for sharing his time and knowledge with us and for delivering this lecture amid his busy schedule. Sir, your address. set the tone for this course by clearly discussing the religion in post independent india and sri lanka we are blessed to have you contribute to this course next i wish to thank ms vasuki jasinka dr hemanth premaratna and all other staff at kdu for bringing this lecture together thank you last but not least i thank all participants from our university for joining us today Your participation has made this lecture a successful event and I believe it has provided you with a new insight into the political landscape of Asia. To conclude, let me once more express my gratitude to honorable Dr. Suren Raghava for delivering today's lecture. Sir, it's an honor to have you with us and your time and efforts are deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Same with me. I'm honored to be associated seated with uh, kdu and my attempt will be we have some challenges about uh, your university at the parliament we will try to overcome them and uh, i have special respect for kdu students and their commitments i thank you your vice chancellor and the board of uh, governance governance there thank you vasuki for putting this together and uh, i forget your first name now uh vijay vikram <laughs> i'm not there so thank you very okay. much thank you very much for you coordinating today all the students who stood with us and i wish you all the best and to become serious intellectuals at least some of you if not all to contribute to sri lanka uh, our mother country our motherland the blessed land is future is in your hand uh, some of you decide to may decide to go abroad some of you may decide to stay here whatever you do uh this is a blessed land i have gone to i have had the privilege of visiting 62 countries and 78 cities uh, but after all those countries i love my country i i love sri lanka uh, we can make this country one of the best uh not only south asia but uh, all of the world if we possible and i wish all of you will contribute to that future and may Uh, all the blessings come to our leaders uh, his excellency the president gotra birati patsa prime minister and all the others at the <coughs> your leadership uh general uh, kamal kundatna who is doing an excellent job in the covid situation we even compared to india and the military's contribution was excellent and un- unbelievably unparalleled it is uh, established fact so we thank all those people and uh, thank you very much once again 
inviting me to this lecture and i hope you benefited thank you all thank, thank you, you. I will.